What goes through your head when you lock in Mae for the first time? Is it something like, oh, I finally got this character, she's so good. Or maybe even something like this. This champ is so OP, I can't wait to destroy with her. If you thought any of the above, you may have the wrong idea about Maeve. While she is a very fun and agile champion, she's one of the hardest to learn and pick up. And many people I've spoken with in the past give up on her entirely because they feel they can't get better. But that's what I'm here to help you all with today, with my How to Train Your Maeve guide. In this guide, I will try to cover the basics as well as some things many people may not know about Maeve. Here I have timestamps where each part will be, so if there's a certain thing about Maeve you want to know, feel free to skip your way through to the designated part of the guide. But who knows, you may learn something you didn't know or something that can help you by watching the whole video. The first thing I want to discuss is her base kit. I know this may seem like something that is not needed, but for new players or someone who does not know Maeve or Paladins for that matter, they may want to know the basics of the character. Maeve's primary weapon is two knives that do 400 damage each when hitting an enemy. They are projectiles that have a slight distance curve, and they have travel time and are direct damage. It is possible to only land one knife on a target as a result of moving or flicking at the cast time. Maeve's secondary fire is called Pounce. Pounce allows Maeve to dash through the air or collide with an enemy doing 400 damage, then knocking Maeve back off the enemy. Pounce has a 10 second cooldown which can get shortened by loadout cards that I will get to later. Maeve's first ability is called Nine Lives. When activated, Maeve flips her left knife around her index finger, resetting her pounce cooldown as well as her secondary ability, Prowl, as well as healing Maeve for 400 health on cast. Nine Lives has a 20 second cooldown that can also be lowered through loadouts. Maeve's secondary ability is called Prowl. Maeve gains 50% movement speed and is able to jump higher for 5 seconds. Using another ability or weapon shot will cancel Prowl, and Prowl has a 12 second cooldown. The last part about her kit is her ultimate, Midnight. Upon casting, Mae flips her knives around her fingers and submerges 300 feet from the casting location into darkness. Enemies affected by Midnight have their vision restricted to a 30 foot radius for 4 seconds. Midnight is, however, affected by resilience, causing the duration to be shortened. Midnight's duration cannot be shortened below 2 seconds. Loadouts. When it comes to builds with Maeve, there are not certain cards that you have to use at certain values that pertain to a certain talent. For example, Leon has a talent called Imminence. In order to run a proper build for that talent, you need Heraldry 5. Hitting Presence reduces the cooldown of Presence by 5 seconds. But for Maeve, you can create a speed build, a cooldown reduction build, a self-sustain build, or a combination, and it will work with any talent you choose. Here are the three main talents to choose from with Maeve. Cat Burglar, Street Justice, and Rogue's Gambit. Cat Burglar is the first talent given for Maeve. This talent will cause your first two weapon shots after prowling to do 30% more damage. This is also seen as Maeve's best talent by the higher ranks. The second talent you unlock is Street Justice. This talent allows you to pounce to execute a target below 35% of their base health. Nicknamed Skill Justice, this talent is looked down on by many players for being very easy to use and a cheap way to get kills. This is also the talent I would recommend for new Maeve players to help them get the hang of the champion before branching out. The last talent you unlock is Rogue's Gambit. This talent will reset your pounce cooldown when getting an elimination. This talent tends to be almost every Maeve main's favorite for the mobility and skill taken to use. Personally, when it comes to loadouts, I make many different kinds. I have a build focused around a combination of speed, self-sustain, and damage reduction. But now I had to redo this section of the guide because there were a couple of changes that came with the new update to her cards. Six cents, which is damage reduction after pouncing, can only be capped out at 20% instead of 25, making you have to put more points into it for it to be useful. Predation was changed from movement speed out of combat to when hitting knife shots, it will reduce the cooldown of prowl. That is a new meta way to play Maeve, with the new Predation card on 5 and the Cat Burglar talent. Now here is a build that kind of focuses on a well-rounded approach. Now this is not suitable for Cat Burglar and Predation per se, but you can still use Cat Burglar with it. It is 6 cents 5, Scamper 4, Walk It Off 3, Shred 2, and Chase 1. Now this personally is a build I would use for Rogue's Gambit, but you can use it with any talent because her... I'll, I'll get to that later. But this is the build that I will recommend to people when asking about builds for Maeve. It has a well-rounded approach and it doesn't focus too much on one aspect. 
I do have builds for when I know I'll have a Genos pocket. Predation 5, Six Sense 4, Chase 3, Scamper 2, and Street Cred 1. This build is focused more around the new Cat Burglar build. If I know I'll have a sustained income of healing, I can branch out a bit more into less or no self-healing. Now, here is the build that I've been using for ranked recently. It is Walk It Off 4, Six Sense 4, Predation 5, Street Cred 1, and On Edge 1. This build is for Cat Burglar, and I know there is no like speed cards like Scamper and Chase, but that is because I feel that survival is more important than being fast. I do a lot of experimenting with builds, and I switch up my slots often, so I am sorry if you went and copied a test build by accident. But one main thing I'd like to point out about these builds is they aren't really talent locked. I could take my well-rounded build and use any talent with it and perform the same. It all comes down to which type of build best suits how you want to play. Though some builds do have Predation 5, that does not lock you into Cat Burglar. It's still very useful when using Rogue Scambit or even Street Justice to get your Prowl up more often than you would usually have it. Sensitivity. This is something I've been asked about numerous times in the comments, on my Instagram, and even on Facebook. My current sensitivity is 8 on the x-axis, 6 on the y-axis, turn acceleration strings then on 5, and I play on precision mode. Keep in mind that sensitivity is a preference on what you prefer. What works for me might not work for you. So if you want to try out my sensitivity, feel free, but just tweak it to your liking. Training your aim. This sort of falls back into the sensitivity category. Aiming and sensitivity are like partners. I've been using the same sensitivity for about two years now, and as a result, I've developed a muscle memory to how it feels to turn and flick, making those actions easier. This part is for console players. A recent option for Switch and PS4 players, I'm not sure about Xbox, let me know in the comments if I'm wrong, is the introduction of gyro controls. Gyro allows you to turn your character by turning the controller itself, making it to where you don't have to use the stick to turn. Some players who use Gyro very well, and you may know these players, are Raukion and Spyro Blades. I'll link their channels in the description, so definitely go check them out. Now before you ask in the comments, no, I do not use and will never use Gyro, and I'll tell you why. I've been playing Paladin since July 2nd of 2017, and Maeve since August of 2017. Gyro wasn't around back then, so I had no other choice but to use the sticks. No, I won't use mouse and keyboard either. And I've been playing and learning from then until now, or I should say when Gyro came out, and I feel all the time I put into being good with the sticks would be wasted, and I feel I would not be I would feel I would be starting over if I moved to Gyro. I'm not knocking Gyro, I just don't like it personally. I highly suggest to console players to change your jump button from the default. I have changed my jump to L1, LB for Xbox, and I've put 9 lives on X, A for Xbox, and I've been using these settings for about 2 years now. This allows me to keep both my thumbs on both sticks at all times, making it much easier and smoother to aim. This at first will feel weird and you'll probably waste your 9 lives a lot, but if you put in the time to learn it, I promise you you'll see improvements in your aim. Okay, this part of the guide is going to be a bit different, but I thought I should include how I hold my controller and what kind of controller I use. Just because I was talking to Wake about how I how I position my thumbs and such, and he said it was actually different than him, and it was like quite different in general, so I thought I'd include this part. So this is the controller I've been using for about two and a half years. It's the one that came with my PlayStation, and I've just always used it. <laughs> when I jump... I rest my finger like this over L1. So if you bend your finger like this, you see crease, crease here. That part between my two creases is what pushes down the L1 button. So it's like this. This is how I jump when I'm playing mate. Now when I rest my thumbs on the sticks, the joint in the middle of my thumb is what is pushing against the stick itself. So when I'm moving up, down, no, it, I'm, I'm using more so the joint on my thumb and not so much the tip of my thumb. Now, Wake said this was a bit weird, I think, because he kind of holds it like this and he uses the tip of his thumb to push it, kind of, where I just use the joint. I, I don't know. I hope this part was helpful if you guys had questions about 
the controller. I don't know. This part is not scripted. I'm just talking. Yeah, and as you can see, there's no paddles on it. I don't use a scuff. My screen is currently going crazy because this is connected to my thing right now. But I hope this part was helpful and informative. Another way I helped train my aim was while in spawn, choose a teammate or object in the room and practice keeping your reticle on said object or player while jumping and strafing. This helps in game when fighting a champion who doesn't have vertical mobility. The more advanced tactic is to pounce away from the object or player and practice flicking back to said target. This helps when using pounce for movement and when you need to flick while in the air. Back to my first statement about sensitivity, find out what you like before practicing. If you can find a sensitivity you're comfortable with, then keep it and don't change it. Changing it will block the development of muscle memory, making it harder to improve with the sticks. Positioning with Maeve. I won't touch too much on positioning because I know that all situations will be different and depending on what champions you're up against, you may have to play different too. But I'll give a couple examples. Okay. Let's say you're playing on Bright Marsh. That's a really good map for Maeve. For a lot of the game, when fighting for the point capture, you'll want to play more on the roofs of the buildings. Being up on top allows you to shoot people from above, which may cause delayed reaction time on their part, not knowing where the shots are coming from and allowing you to get the advantage. You can also get a good view into their backline from the rooftop, allowing you to chase after a low health support trying to back up from the fight. And with Rogue's Gambit, you can pounce in and out quickly if you secure the kill, keeping your line lives for a better time. Playing the rooftops will also protect your team from an enemy like Androxus or Willow who will contest that high ground, <laughs> denying high ground to an enemy that excels from high ground can be a very big game changer. That's why as a champion that could move vertically, it's important to secure high ground for your team. Now this is a more situational ideology of positioning. With what I'm about to explain, you really can't make a smart decision until you know how your enemy is playing. When you first get into a game, your initial goal as Maeve is to take out the enemy support and their and or their damage. But that's the black and white. Say you go to try to get the enemy Maldamba. You're on Serpent Beach and you take the high grounded side and get behind the enemies. You take a couple shots at the Damba before he slithers to his teammate who helps him out and ends up killing you. No biggie, he had help, so you try again and again and realize that his teammates are watching for you so they can help their healer. This is when you stop flanking. If you were to continue trying to flank someone and constantly being put into a situation where the numbers are stacked against you, you're feeding and not being helpful. Instead, play a more passive role and I've been ridiculed for playing like this before until you have an opening or ask a teammate to help you. If you can get an angle on Damba or his damage that is stuck next to him like glue, just poke at them until you can chip some health down. If you get one low enough, you can push and finish them off before they're able to be healed, especially since you should have been buying cauterize. I'll get to items later. A lot of people think that supports can only heal, flanks have to kill enemy healer, and tank must sit on point. Those people have not been playing the game very long. That or they refuse to try anything that isn't the basic role description. Of course I exaggerated that a bit for emphasis. But don't feel like you have to keep pushing when you know that you'll be outnumbered. Take a smart approach. Push with a teammate or poke from a distance and dive when you know you can get the kill. Now this part isn't really about positioning as Maeve, but something you should do to make your life a bit easier. Say the enemy has a flank that keeps going behind you and trying for your healer. Hang back a bit and help your healer fight off that flank. Now you're becoming the situation we just discussed, having a number advantage on the flanker. This can easily turn the point fight in your team's favor, allowing you to play more freely since your team now outnumbers the enemy team. Ability management and ultimate usage. I see a lot of Maeve players dive me and use up every last cooldown before they realize that they're going to die. This goes for anyone really, but I'll try to pertain this to Maeve. If you're going into the enemy backline, here are some do's and don'ts about when to use abilities given a few situations. Situation 1. The enemy Saris just used Shadow Travel and is about half health. When you see her come out, she is alone and without her team but in her own backline. Your nine lives still has 15 seconds until you're able to use it again, but you have both your pounce and prowl. What is the smartest way to go about this situation? Do, try to stagger her from her team before the enemies respawn. Prowl into the fight and use your knife shots to kill her. Avoid pouncing unless you know you'll be able to secure the kill. That way you can still escape when the enemies come back. 
Assuming you're using Rogue's Gambit with any other talent, save the pounce for disengaging. Don't. Use up all your abilities, causing yourself to be a sitting duck when the enemies return from spawn. Situation 2. Androxus is flanking behind you and you notice. You go to fight him and you use Prowl and Pounce in the process. He has not used his abilities yet. What should you do? Do. Use 9 lives to reset your abilities and use them to avoid his reversal. Don't. Be afraid to use 9 lives in a solo engagement if you need to. If you win the fight, you'll still be able to take on another enemy by poking, and then you should almost have Pounce ready again. Now, if the Androxus was half health and used his abilities, don't feel the need to use your 9 lives. Getting the kill and saving your biggest cooldown will allow you to be more aggressive in the next fight. Now, for this next part, I'll explain how to properly use Maeve's ultimate. A lot of people have messaged me and asked me when to use it or commented asking, and... Here, I hopefully answer any unanswered questions about Maeve's ultimate. Maeve's ultimate can be used as a reverse Cassie ult. In the beginning of a round, when approaching the objective, this is the most common way that I see it used. Blind the enemies and get to a suitable position to take someone out early on in the round. When the enemies are trying to re-engage. Say you've wiped out the enemy team and your team only needs a couple extra seconds to cap the point. Using Midnight can allow your team that, that couple extra seconds you need. The enemies won't be able to see, which will cause them to be passive until they can, or rush in blind where they most likely will be killed seconds after touching the point. To make a big push slash combo with another character. This is one of my favorite ways to use Midnight. So, say you have a Bomb King or a Drogos, and you hear them activate their ultimate. Using Midnight can be the perfect way to get more kills with Dragon Punch or King Bomb, and the enemies won't be able to see it coming. This allows more push time in the payload, or even more time the payload will digress. To save a teammate. This is probably one of the most helpful ways to use Midnight. Say you have a Grover. He's being chased down by Talus. He uses his vine and goes up into the air, or gets a little bit of distance between him and Talus, but Talus is still pushing. Activating Midnight will allow Grover to get a better location while Talus can't track where he's going, possibly forcing Talus to teleport back to his rune of travel. If it were a different character, you and Grover could then double team and tilt the number of odds in your favor. Items For Maeve, and really all damage characters, the main priority in items is Cauterize, if the enemy has any form of healing. Having Cauterize makes flanking easier if you can decrease the healing someone receives while you try to take them out. Items like Wrecker can be good too after getting Cauterize. Buying Wrecker for a Vivian alone would also help you get that one kill to save your frontliner or your support. An item you never want to buy with Maeve is Life Rip. You're better off buying Kronos. Life Rip doesn't do enough for Maeve, especially since Cauterize will still affect it. If you're looking for more sustain in fights, buy into Haven or Blast Shields. It will help you out more. And I kind of like to call Haven and Blast Shields the reverse life rip that can't be countered. Usually my item buys will be first cauterize, then usually defensive for whatever I'm having problems with. If I feel healing, well, I'll pick up rejuve, but if not, I usually go with kill to heal. I almost never get to the utility items, but Nimble and Kronos are good buys. More so Nimble. Tips and tricks. Now I will tell you a few things you may not have known about Maeve. Number one. And this is a fairly basic tip that many people do know about, but Maeve's Pounce can go through Shields, Adroxus Reversal, and Power Siphon because it's a melee attack. Number 2. While in Prowl, Maeve has increased jump height. Using this combined with a Z jump, which is jumping against a wall, will increase your jump height even more. A good combination with this is, since you're getting insane height already, save your second jump to psych out the enemy. Number 3. This next tip kind of goes with the last point I mentioned. So after pouncing, Maeve gains an additional jump no matter if you've used your double jump already or not. Having this in mind, waiting to use your second jump after pouncing is a strategic way to outplay your enemy. Otherwise, using it right away will result in you falling in a straight line, and I like to call this the quote-unquote falling hitbox. Number 4. While using Midnight, Maeve's Prowl is completely silent to the enemies as long as you're outside of their vision radius. Number 5. The Animation Cancel. This is something that will help you a lot while pushing someone. If you shoot and pounce directly afterwards, the animation for shooting your knives will cancel and you 
pounce forward quicker than shooting and pouncing normally. Okay, number six, the jump strafe. And I'm pretty sure this is for console only. So there's a way you can strafe in the air, which can be used as a way to outplay your enemy when you're saving cooldowns or you're out of cooldowns. So move your left stick in one direction at the same time that you jump. And at the same time as activating your second jump, move your stick in the other direction. You should be moving similar to how you would be on the ground. PC for some reason cannot move like this, and it's been tested by my good friend Sushi. Either that, or he was doing it wrong, but I explained it thoroughly and it just didn't seem to work that way for him. Number 7, Midnight Tracking. I noticed while in a 1v1, I was able to track the enemy Maeve after she activated Midnight by listening to the source of the ultimate sound. I first noticed this on the Demonette skin, and noticed it as well on Street Style, Merrymaker, and especially on the new Pirate skins. It's like you can hear the source of the ultimate on Maeve's character herself, and you can hear it going up, down, left, and right, whatever way the Maeve is moving. And that's, now this may only work with good quality headsets, I'm not 100% sure. Now this is going to be the end of the guide, and I really appreciate your guys' patience with me because I know I've been taking forever to make this. I think I announced it back in like March of 2019, so I really apologize for that. I hope that this was very informative and helpful, and just if you have any other questions that I didn't cover in the guide, hit me up on my Instagram, uh, Victoria Grimmery, Victoria underscore Grimmery, and I'll try to answer your questions there. I really appreciate all the support I've been getting as well. I've I've hit 8,000 subscribers. I never thought that this would happen ever, <laughs> honestly. And I just, I'm not scripting right now, so <laughs> I just really appreciate everything and all the support. And it really makes my day when I find one of you guys in a game and you're like, oh my god, I love your videos, or oh hey, I know you. It just makes me really happy when something like that happens. So thank you so much, guys, and just let me know what you think about this whole video, message me your questions, and I'll see you in the next video.